and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Good God. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. But, notice this closely, there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Oh yes, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Did you, did you get that? Then Simon himself believed also. They, they preached till the witch believed. They preached until demons trembled. They preached until Satan's cult was broken over that city. They preached until there was a change in the heavenlies and in the atmosphere. They preached until yokes were broken and the bound were set free. Somebody say yes. yes. I want to preach tonight and I want you to just indulge me tonight as I share with you. Just reach over to somebody and shake them by the hand and say, neighbor, neighbor. Tonight, is your night. tonight is your night. The spell, the spell. is broken over your life. I want, I want to deal tonight. Some of us have been functioning with struggles and strife and demonic warfare has come against us in supernatural ways to hinder the move of God over your life. But I believe tonight that if you'll flow with me in the realm of the Holy Ghost, that spirits of poverty and doubt and fear and depression and affliction will be broken over your house, over your finances, and over your life tonight. I believe that there's a reason that you're in this building tonight. The enemy doesn't want you to be in here, but the devil is alive. If you're anywhere in this building or outside or in the overflow, or if you get your hand on this tape, I believe Satan's power is going to be broken in a supernatural way. Take a few moments and give him praise right now. Give God praise right now. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh in this place tonight. Saturate us with supernatural anointing. Bind in fetters and chains every hindering spirit. I thank you for being the God of all flesh. There's nothing too hard for you. Have your way in this house tonight. Declare yourself in the midst of your people. I thank you for being God and beside you, there is no other. Have your way, oh God, in Jesus' name. 
somebody shout amen glory you may be seated in his presence glory to God y'all doing all right today amen the book of Acts starts a discussion that defines and establishes the New Testament church in a very powerful and prolific way. It causes us to understand the unfolding of what God had in mind when he sent Christ into the earth. King James, as he begins to compile of the scriptures, calls it or titles it the Acts of the Apostles. But up under close scrutiny, if you will look closely at the book of Acts, you will begin to realize that it is not so much about the acts of the apostles, but rather the acts of God. That God sovereignly and supernaturally is in control in the book of Acts in such a profound way that I often, when teaching out of the book of Acts, compare it to the book of Genesis. I do so because the book of Acts declares for us a mile marker whereby stepping into it, we have actually stepped into the New Testament. As opposed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is listed as the New Testament to you, really, if you read the book of Hebrews, you will know that the Testament is not enforced until the testator dies. When Christ died on the cross in the Old Testament, he rose up delivering to us a new testament or a new covenant which is in his blood and with it comes an administration of the spirit that is very comparable to what we see in the book of acts in the book of acts in the book of genesis rather in the book of genesis chapter one in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void it says and darkness covered the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. That word moved in Hebrew literally means to hover like a hen does over eggs for the purpose of hatching. That same hovering Spirit of God that hovered over the earth in the book of Genesis is the same Spirit of God that hovers over the early church in the book of Acts and releases supernatural power. We need today in our churches that hovering presence of God that we see in the book of Acts that the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one place with one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Cloven tongues appeared like as a fire and sat upon each of them, sat upon each of them, sat as in hovering in the book of Genesis. In the book of Acts it says the Holy Ghost sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. We need that hatching process. Not that just a drop of anointing, not just a touch of anointing, not just chill bumps and goose pimples and excitement. We need the hovering presence of God to hover over certain situations until the fullness of God is manifested in our lives. Quite frankly, sometimes we're in too big of a hurry. We get in a rush for God to move. We get in a rush for God to finish. But for some of the strongholds that we're dealing with today, we need the hovering presence of God to just sit on us, on our circumstances, on our church, on our family, or whatever is up under attack until God has accomplished his purpose in our lives. The Bible said it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And it was noised abroad without flyers, without brochures, without radio ministries, without television ministries, without any technology. The move of the Holy Ghost caused a noise to affect all of the cities in the area. There's something about the move of God that when God really begins to move, nobody can hinder or stop the move of God. You're talking about marketing. When God moves, everybody will recognize that God is moving in your life, in your church, in your house. You don't have to walk around with a big sign on your head that says God is in my life. If there's a real anointing on your life, everybody is going to recognize that there is an anointing on your life. You don't change your method of preaching or teaching depending on where you go. You just are who you are. 
And if that anointing is resident upon your life, pretty soon people will recognize that God is using you. There was a great move of God, and in the absence of the physical presence of Jesus Christ, the disciples clung to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the place where they experienced the power of God. Jerusalem, the city of peace, the city of power, and the place of transformation. It was there that they hovered up under the anointing for a move of God. And it is good for us to come back to the place where we experience the power of God. But there came a point and a time that they were clinging to the place that they experienced God more than they were clinging to God himself. Hear me closely now because I want to get into some things that you need to consider. Tradition will make us build monuments where God wants us to have a movement. The traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. And many times if we've experienced God working in a particular place or a particular way, we keep trying to make God do again what he did back then. But God says, I'm going to do a new thing in you. Many times we get stuck in a system and a pattern and a rut, a denomination, a philosophy, a board, a group, a committee, and we don't think that God can move any other way other than how we experienced him 10 years ago. But how many of you know that God is a moving God? God is a moving God. From the book of Genesis, when the Spirit of God moved to the book of Revelations, where it says, even so, come Lord Jesus, God is moving. All through the wilderness, God's Spirit was moving. And the challenge of the church was to keep up with the cloud because God was moving. I want to challenge you, if you want to be on the cutting edge of what God is doing, you can't get in a church, a movement, or a denomination, or anything that's not going anywhere. Too many people are loyal to dead things. If you're going to get in the flow of God, you've got to get in the flow of God and be liquid enough to be willing to change with what God is doing now. Oh, I feel something in here. Now somebody said God doesn't change. Yes, he doesn't change, but his methods do change. If his methods didn't change, we'd still be burning lambs and offering up sacrifice. God's methods do change. And that is why we have to come to him every day and say, give us this day our daily bread. You can't keep operating off the revelation that you got 10 years ago. God wants to do something fresh in your life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But the disciples were getting stuck in a system. Whenever there was a problem, they went back to Jerusalem. Whenever there was an issue, they went back to Jerusalem. And any time we get stuck in a system or a pattern or a tradition, God has to shake us out of that system. The Bible compares it to an eagle stirring her nest. When you get stuck in systems, God will stir you up to make you move to the next level. In the book of Acts chapter 8, you will read that God began to stir them up through persecution. One of the quickest ways that God can move you out of a situation is to allow persecution to arise. Now, I know you don't like persecution, but you've got to understand that God will use persecution and often rejection to give you direction. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who it is. God will use rejection to give you direction. If you weren't rejected, you would stay where you were. But God will shut a door so that he can open another door in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, too many of us spend too much time crying in front of closed doors. But God told Samuel, weep no longer over what I've rejected. I found me a man. God doesn't want you standing in front of a closed door, weeping over what could have been, when God is ready to do a new thing in your life. If the Lord allowed you to be persecuted, it's only because he's stirring you up for something fresh and something new. If God allowed people to reject you, it's only that through that rejection, you might have direction. And if you'll open up to what God is going to do, after a while, you'll go back to the person that rejected you and say, it was good for me that I was rejected. 
If you hadn't have rejected me, I'd have stayed in a rut. I'd have stayed closed down in a system. I'd have stayed in a tradition or a denomination. But because you rejected me, it made me get down on my knees and seek God. Thank you for hating me. Thank you for pushing me out. Thank you for making me pray. Thank you for making me call on the name of the Lord. Thank you for making me lay on my face before God. Thank you for making me believe God for the supernatural. Thank you for not accepting me in your clique and your club and your group and your committee. Thank you. In the book of Acts, it says that when persecution arose, then Philip went down to Samaria. God used persecution to give Philip direction as to what he was going to do next in your life. I don't know who I came here to preach to tonight, but God is getting ready to take you someplace you've never been, to show you something that you've never seen, so that you can do something that you've never done. Don't worry when he rocks the boat a little bit and stirs things up a little bit because God is getting you out of your comfort zone and away from deadbeat people so that he can take you into another dimension. Whoever you are, you ought to shout about that right now. Glory to God. Then Philip went down to Samaria. How many times has persecution been the usher that ushered you into the next change in your life? And you say, oh yes, Lord, I can hear you now. The Bible says in the book of Joel that God used the Syrian army and he said that they were his army. It was an enemy, but God used the enemy to accomplish his purpose. You know, God will use the devil to bless you. Let me give it to you another way. He'll make your enemy your footstool. He'll take the opposition and use it to push you. And somebody in this room is being pushed into another dimension, pushed outside of your comfort zone, pushed away from people that you've loved and been dear to all of your life. But something is pushing you into another dimension with God. You better go with it because your blessing is just on the other side of the hill. You better go with it because God is getting ready to unlock a door for you and bring you into another dimension. Then Philip went down from Jerusalem, away from the safe place, hanging around with safe people, away from tradition, away from ideas and religious regimentation. He got out of the boat, he got out of the clique, he stepped out of the system, then he went down into Samaria where God had an assignment for you. My God, I'm excited. I'm excited because God has an assignment for you. You can always know that God has an assignment for you when the enemy sends an assassin to destroy you. It's only a sign that God has an assignment for you. Good God. He went down into Samaria. You see, the Lord had some unfinished business in Samaria. You will remember how Jesus stopped in the Gospel of St. John chapter 4 and told his disciples, I must need go through Samaria. You go on and get something to eat. He said, but my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I've got to go down to Samaria. And look at Jesus, as busy and important as he was, went down to Samaria and sat down by a well, waiting all day, not for a big crowd like this. He sat by the well all day to plant a seed in one woman. Good God of mercy. One woman, she wasn't a missionary, she wasn't a prayer warrior, she wasn't a Bible school teacher. One upset, confused, disturbed woman. But God was preparing her for her destiny and he sat by the well. Good God, I feel like preaching. You better hold me up in here because I, when I think about Jesus sitting by the well, I think about a well sitting on a well. 
Jesus is Jacob's well. What Jacob's well was physically, Christ was spiritually. A well sitting by a well, waiting on a thirsty, radical woman to come down to the well, seeking a solution for her dilemma. Here comes the woman down to the well, and Jesus changed her life. The Bible says in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. John that the woman left the well, dropped her water pots, and went running into the city of Samaria saying, Come see a man who told me everything I had ever done. Jesus had to straighten her out. She was confused about relationships. She was confused about religion. Jesus said, your people worship in the mountain, they know not what. But the hour cometh and now is. Good God. The hour the hour cometh and now is. Uh, I, I used to couldn't handle that text because I couldn't figure how an hour could be coming and now is. But, but, but he says, now woman, this is your hour, but then your hour is coming. It, it is your hour because I'm talking to you now, but, but what I'm talking to you about now won't be completed now because something is coming after this that's going to be greater than that. The hour cometh and now is. So then in the Gospel of St. John chapter 4, the hour is, but in Acts chapter 8 we see what was coming. For Philip is the completion of what Jesus began in the Gospel of St. John chapter 4. Jesus planted a seed in Samaria in John chapter 4 that explodes in Acts chapter 8. The hour cometh and now is. Some of the things that God told you right now are still coming to pass. You're shouting about it now, but it's going to manifest in your life later. The hour cometh and now is that they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Who am I preaching to tonight? Then Philip went down to Samaria. I like the way God uses men. One man against a city. He didn't send a board. He didn't send a committee. He didn't send a gang. He didn't send a mob. He said, one man, God is so powerful that he doesn't have to send a group of people to back you up. If God is on your side, he is more than the world against you. One, 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 somebody holler, let me be the one. When God got ready to create all of humankind, he started with one man named Adam. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? When God got ready to choose his chosen people, he started with one man named Abram. When God got ready to deliver them from the famine, he started with one man named Joseph. When they had been held by the Pharaoh too long, God started with one man named Moses. Whenever God gets ready to do anything, all he needs is one. Somebody holler, let me be the one. I came all the way to London to tell you, you're it. You are the one that God is calling for for this last day. That's why the enemy is trying to destroy you because you are the man that God is going to use in a supernatural way. I, I didn't come to preach. I came to prophesy. You are the man. You better get ready for what God has for you. Slap somebody and tell them I'm the one. I'm the one, I'm the one. I didn't pick myself, I didn't choose myself, I didn't appoint myself, I didn't call myself, but I'm the one. Have you ever had God put you in a place that you didn't even ask to be in, but because he predetermined and is an eternal counsel that you would be the one, you've got to step in and do it. Then Philip went down to Samaria. Oh, I feel like preaching tonight. He went down to Samaria because God had unfinished business. He had said in the Gospel of St. John chapter 4, I will give you houses that you didn't build and vineyards that you didn't grow. I'll cause you to step into things that you didn't even have to labor for. 
God, oh, God has set you up in a blessing. He planted it with the woman at the well, but he said, I'm going to bring you into a harvest that you don't even have to work to do. Some of you are going to have to step into some things. I mean, God will bless you. It won't even make sense how God blesses you. People will be jealous because they say, I had to work real hard to get what you stepped into. But when God sends you to a city, they shut up, oh, shut up. Oh, bless his name. Then Philip went down to Samaria. You got to go down. You got to get down in it. It's messy, but you got to get down in it. It's controversial, but you've got to get down in it. You're going to be criticized, but you've got to get down in it. And you got to know that he that has began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Good God. He went down into Samaria. And when he went down, he began to preach. And signs and wonders and miracles began to follow the word of God. Isn't it amazing that by the foolishness of preaching, just the foolishness of preaching the gospel. You don't have to have anything going for you. You don't, you don't have to have money. You don't have to have help. You don't have to be cute. You don't have to be anything. Just be anointed. And if you start preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, signs and wonders will follow you. Don't let them get in front of you. Let them follow. Oh, you don't hear what I said. Some folk put the signs up front. They ought to follow you into the battle. Somebody's going into a battle, but the battle is not yours. It belongs to God. When you get in it, the miracles are going to show up in your life. Shout yes! Went down into Samaria. Signs and wonders, miracles, healings, strongholds destroyed by the power of God and the Bible says and there was great joy in the city somebody say great joy uh, I don't I don't want to bother you over here but 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 but, but, but uh, there's something wrong if you're sitting up in a church where there is no joy because the Bible said with joy we draw waters from the wells of salvation <laughs> I don't know what they do over there, but in America, we got people in churches because their grandmama laid the first brick and their, their daddy was the first trustee and, and they're, they're out of loyalty. But you know something, you better go for the move of God. You, you, you can't stay in a place because tradition said be there. You got to be in a flow of the Holy Ghost and there ought to be some joy. Frankly, I don't like to sit beside somebody that don't have some joy. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I like to sit beside somebody that we can come into agreement so that when I say hallelujah, you say hallelujah. I got enough demons to deal with later without sitting beside a demon. When I say thank you, you say Jesus. When I say glory, you say the God. Oh, shut the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why do you believe in the power of agreement? Because one can chase a thousand. Now, if we were adding, it would make sense to say, if one can chase a thousand, two ought to be able to chase two thousand. But because we're not adding, we're multiplying. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. God is going to multiply, exponential, press down, shaking together, running over, blessing. It, it ain't going to make no sense. You can't count it. You can't add it up. Surely, blessings I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply thee. And the Bible says there was great joy in the city. Touch seven people and say, have you got any joy? Yeah. 
Have you got any joy? You don't have no joy, you better get up and move. Have you got any joy? You better get out of my way. Have you got any joy? I came for a breakthrough. Have you got any joy? I came for deliverance. Have you got any joy? I believe God is able. Have you got any joy? Joy like a river. Joy like a river. Joy like a river. Joy full of glory. Joy supernatural. Holy Ghost. to tell you the day of the big important creature sitting up with his legs crossed looking hateful is over. God is calling for worshipers. People who lay on their face and bless the Lord and lift their hands and give God birth. Have you got it in joy? Joy will fill your church. Joy will make it grow. Joy will set you on fire. three people tell them something's gonna happen in here tonight I can feel it in my hands I can feel it in my feet I can feel it my toes are tingling my hair is standing on edge something something that I will send that I will see something that I will see something is oh 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 And, uh, sit with me, sit with me. I, I, I don't mean to get this happy this fast. I, 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 uh, I would be through with it, you know. I would be through. We could just stop with great joy and just shout out. But at the end of it saying there being great joy in the city, the next word is but. Joy. See, it's not enough. It's good. It's important. It's wonderful. But it's not enough. They had great joy, but they still had Simon. Simon. Oh, Simon. Simon. That sleazy snake of a man. Simon the sorcerer who had cast a spell over the city and the book said that he had convinced them that he was some great wonder see the enemy doesn't mind us having joy as long as we don't challenge his dominion and his authority he doesn't mind us shouting and dancing as long as we don't take over his territory and his stuff. He doesn't mind us having church as long as we don't do anything with the church that we have. But I came to tell you this is your year to do something for God. High five somebody and say do it. Don't just shout about it. Don't just shout about it. Don't just dance about it. Don't just leap about it. Don't just run about it. Do it. Uh, Simon had taken over the city. Can I preach this tonight? He had set up his territory. See, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, magistrates, demonic territories, spheres of influence, where the enemy owns regions that he doesn't want to release a region that's why God sends you into a region 
to do warfare against the principality in that region. I've traveled all over the world and, and every area has certain demonic influences and certain propensities and, and look like every church goes so far and they run into a wall and fall backward but there, there's something that God wants you to break over that city. Somebody holler, break it! Now, Simon, watch this, Simon the sorcerer thought he controlled Samaria. God sent Philip not just to get folks happy but to come against Simon the sorcerer. Notice when Jesus comes to the tomb of Gadarenes and finds a man possessed with devils and he says what is your name and the demon says we are legion for we are many. Legion means that Satan is organized. That's, that's, that's why I have a problem with a church that's not organized. See, Satan is organized. When he attacks you, he attacks you systematically, strategically. He knows exactly where to hit you. He studies. The devil studies. See, church folk don't study, but the devil sits up and studies. Studies your background. Studies your childhood. Studies your weaknesses. He knows exactly where to hit you to, to try to bring you down said we're legion, we're organized, we're regimented, we march as one man, we, we move in a systematic order. You remember what Jesus said when they said he was casting out demons by the power of the other blood? He said Satan has a kingdom, but Satan's kingdom is not divided. For if a kingdom be divided against itself, it shall not stand. I challenge you, nowhere in the Bible can you show me where one demon gets into a fight with another demon. You don't see demons fighting demons or witches fighting witches in the Bible. That's why I can't understand why we got so many preachers fighting preachers. Cause oh, I know I'm going to mess up some stuff in here tonight. You might not could take two nights of this. See, if we would ever stop fighting each other, stop competing with one another, get in one place with one accord, God would do miracles beyond anything you can ever imagine. Men with small minds and inferiority complexes always trying to convince their congregation that your gift is the only gift in the body when in fact you're going to need my gift and your gift and his gift and her gift. I better get out of that. I better get out of that. I better get out of that. Because you, you, you can't have a Philip at Samaria if you don't have a woman at the well in Samaria. Uh-oh. Our problem is we're narrow-minded, short-sighted, selfish and carnal. And Satan, on the other hand, is regimented, organized, and strategically using his influence to send legions. That ain't no one spirit fighting you. Those are legions of demons marching like one thing. It took a whole host of hell to come against you. Listen at what the demon said. We don't mind you casting us out, but suffer us not to leave the region. Satan said, I've got so much invested in this territory. I don't mind leaving this man, but don't let me leave this region. Oh God, help me preach. See, the enemy sets up regions, principalities, holding up blessings. Daniel prayed and the principalities and the powers in the air held up his blessing. And by the way, somebody who's been praying for something a long time and God already told you yes and it hadn't happened yet is because Satan had it tied up. But that blessing is loose tonight in the name of Jesus.
He sets up territories. He sets up dominions, principalities, and powers. But slap somebody and say, that devil's got to go. Yeah, that, 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 that devil's got to go. That devil has got to go. That devil that's been fighting you for the last 10 years. Somebody holler, it's gotta go! Uh, let me go a little bit deeper. I want you to understand that when I start talking about principalities and regions and, and territories and, and the demography of the enemy, how he sets up demographic territories, it's not just earth areas that he wants to invade and control. In many cases, because you were made and framed from dirt, the enemy sees you and your family as regions or territories that he wants to control. Suffer us not to leave the region, maybe suffer us not to leave this family. So even though he had to turn you a loose, now he doesn't want to turn your daughter a loose, your son a loose, your brother a loose, your daddy a loose because he's got so much tied up in that region. He said, okay, God, I control Jesse's house. I have it all tied up. I have a broken, dysfunctional family going here. Some kind of way David has gotten loose and got anointed. And he says, if, if, if I can't have David, though he fought for David all of his life, David had to fight against the lust of his flesh all of his life. David had a struggle in his life all of his life. We don't like to be real about it, but he did. He had a struggle all of his life with carnality. Yes, he was spiritual. Yes, he was gifted. But he had a struggle in his flesh all of his life. And his son, Amnon, raped his daughter, Tamar. And his other son, Absalom, betrayed him with a lust for the flesh and the pride of life. And the enemy had set up so much territory that even his chosen son, Solomon, went after concubine, after concubine, after concubine. And this is nothing but demons saying, I don't want to leave this region. Or Abraham, Abram, the man of faith and power who lied about Sarah and almost got her raped by a heathen king before his son Isaac was ever even thought about and yet when Isaac grows up he repeats the same lie that his father did. How did that happen? It's a demon that doesn't want to leave the region. Why is it? that Rebecca is a trickster and a con woman sneaking even before her husband and she produces a child just like her. Her, her uh, Laban was full of trickery and debauchery and Jacob is full of trickery and debauchery and all the way down to the family that is a prevailing of that same spirit. You know there are some families that they have an issue with liars. It's, you don't want to talk about it but it, the, the, you, you know this one lies. The mama lies and lie like grandmama. You married the granddaughter and here's after she gets a certain age she starts lying just like her mama did. It's a spirit. Everybody in the family, nobody can stay married. Nobody can stay faithful. Nobody can stay committed. Everybody's going down. Everybody's going under. It's a spirit. Everybody's struggling in their finances. Have you ever noticed you, you, take, you take people that are struggling in their finances without even knowing it. We pass on to our children spirits of poverty, spirits of fear, spirits of low self-esteem. Even though they study and they go to school, they have struggles breaking the spirit because poverty is a spirit. I said it's a spirit. And the enemy don't mind if you shout and dance and hoop 
and holler as long as you don't come up against that thing that's coming up against you. But I believe with all of my soul that God is raising up a new generation who have the spirit of Philip. You're going to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. I, I know you're blessed. How many blessed people do we have in here? I know you're blessed, but it's not enough for you to be blessed. You got to do war until your son and your daughter and your brother and your sister and your mother and your father come into a blessing until you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Slap three people and tell them I want my house back. I want my house back. I want my house back. Give me my husband. Give me my wife. Give me my son. Give me my daughter. I want them back in the name of Jesus. I take authority over every foul spirit, every unclean spirit that will come against my flesh. Loose me and let me go. My son is loose. My daughter is loose. My brother is loose. My sister is loose. My mother is loose. My father is loose. Somebody give God a crazy praise right now. Give him a 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 praise. Give him a Holy Ghost praise. Give him a supernatural praise. Give him a warfare 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 Give him a warfare Give him a warfare praise. Yes. 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 For your daughter. For your daughter. Somebody's got to fight for your daughter. Roll up your sleeves and fight for your son. I break the power of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. I dare you to praise him. I dare you to praise him. I dare you to praise him. Some of you, you can get a breakthrough anywhere, but in your house, you can be used to bless everybody else's child except your own. You can be used to help everybody else's church except your own. And the enemy is laughing at you, but the joke is on him because tonight, in the name of Jesus, the Send me from Dallas, Texas to tell you the spell is broken over your life in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say break that thing. Break it over your finances. Break it over your prosperity. Break it over that affliction. Break it over that marriage. The spell is broken. The, the spell is broken in the name of Jesus. Build that church. The spell is broken. Well, 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 
Shake the neighbor by the hand, say neighbor. You gotta excuse me tonight. Tonight is my night for a breakthrough. I'm gonna break that spell tonight in the name of Jesus. Now give God a crazy praise. I'm out of time, but I feel some in the room. Get somebody by the hand, join hands with them. Yes. Yes. Squeeze them by the hand. This represents everything that's been tied up in your life tied up in your finances tied up in your marriage tied up in your body tied up with your children squeeze a hand trying to move but you can't get loose trying to run but you can't get free pulling and tugging but you can't get free you've been in a warfare some of you for months some of you for years, you go to bed tired, you wake up tired, because something's got you tied up, it's got your promise tied up, it's got your prophecy tied up, it's got your children tied up, and you're fighting all night long, fight to get to work, fight to get to church, fight to get the building, fight to get the house, not break loose, that's what God's going to do, that's what God's going to do.
Now, before I sit down, all you folk that just came to conference to be a conference, you, you, you're dismissed. But you radical folks who came to get a blessing and you want to see Simon brought down to his knees, run up to this altar and give God a crazy praise right now.